So what does validate our confession of faith? What does prove that we are genuinely Christian? I beg that you would listen. Listen to me. Listen like you've never listened before in your life. Now let me ask you a question. The life that you live, the degree you have chosen, the lifestyle in which you walk, is it for God? And don't play with me. Is it really for God? Don't just say the words. Is it really for God? If we were to open up the heart chamber that holds the motivation, would we see that you really are doing what you do for God? Or is it all about you in God's name? That is the question. And Paul said he was driven by a love for God. Another great motivation in his life was he did what he did, not only out of love for God, but out of love for God's people. He truly loved God's people. He wanted to be with God's people. He wanted to help God's people. We see this in 1 John, if you say that you love God, but you do not love your brother. We see this in Matthew 25, with the division of the nations, the sheep and the goats. That their unbelief in the Christ is proven by the fact that they cared very little for the people of God. Now let me ask you a question. Are you doing what you do for Him? Or is he just some little piece of clothing you put on, some outward thing, a mere confession? Or do you ask yourself this question in your own heart? Just ask yourself, be your own preacher this morning, preach to your heart, ask your heart, do I actually do what I do for him? And some of you who are given over, some of you who are trapped in sin, some of you who live in worldliness and carnality, you're going to have to say, no, I live a carnal lifestyle in the midst of Zion. I live a carnal lifestyle. My heart is full of carnality. I drink it down. I was thinking carnal thoughts when I came in this building and I'll think those thoughts when I leave if this day is like any other day. I'm trying to hurt you, make no mistake about it, but in order to help you, I'm trying to hurt you. Think, discern, examine. What you do, is it for God? What you do, is it out of love for Him and out of love for His people? And then he goes on and he says here, and therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's saying, if anyone, if anyone is in Christ, in Christ, is another way of saying, if anyone is Christian, if anyone is saved, they are a new creature. Are you a new creature? Now here we're going beyond style of life. Here we're going beyond profession of faith. And what are we doing? Ontology. We're going deep now. We're talking about you in your innermost being. Are you a new creature with new desires? Are you? There is a sense in, in the epistles of Paul. We find it in Romans. We find it in Ephesians. We find it in Colossians. This idea of put on Jesus, take off the world and put on Christ. Dress yourself in Christ. That, that that's true. That's biblical. But he's talking in the context of someone who has been radically changed on the inside. So Christianity is not primarily about ethics. Christianity is not picking up a book, book and finding all these new principles to live by and then grinding it out in order to conform your life to those principles. That is not Christianity. Christianity is so powerful. Conversion is so powerful. That if a man were to be converted, 
and did not have access to any principles in the Scriptures, he would still live a different way. You say, can you prove that? It's proven every day around the world where people are dying for Christ and they don't even have a complete New Testament. Now we need Bibles and we need to renew our mind and we need to put on Christ and we need to do all that. But unless inside you are a new creature, all of it's just religion. It's just rule keeping. It's just Phariseeism. The problem today in American Christianity is you don't even have to be a Pharisee and you can still be a part of a church. You can profess Christ and you don't even have to fake righteousness. You can profess Christ, live like a demon and you're still in the body. You're OK because our gospel, our preaching, our theology is so bad. But you did not learn Christ this way in this place. You know, you have been taught if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Are you a new creature? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, and old things pass away, and new things come. I am, I have never been a religious man. My wife questions even my own civility. I was born in the woods, and some people say that's exactly where I should have stayed. I'm not very proper. I don't know which forks to use. In the hotel they put me in last night, I was just amazed at all those new things in the bathroom. I'm not a very cultured person. I'm not a religious person. I don't care about looking nice or in style or anything else. So why am I Christian? Why? It's not because I like the rules, even though I do like the rules now. It's because of Him. It's because of who He is. It's because of what He's done. If I were to describe my Christianity, I would describe my Christianity as this. I'm in a wild animal. It's been roped down by the love of God in Jesus Christ. It's a thing of the heart. It's a thing, it's a deep river. It's not superficial, it's not something you put on. It's what you are because of who He is and what He has done. I'm amazed that so many people in the church today even want to go to heaven. Because heaven is only about God. It's only about the will of God, and it is only about the worship of God. And yet in the church, those three things are so often not even practiced. People will do everything in their power to avoid it. But some of you who are Christians, I want you to listen to me. And, and listen, I'm telling you this because I have the same problem. I'm not judging you. I have the same problem. When when you get even the best of things over and over and over, they become so commonplace. I remember the first time I went through the Andes Mountains in a train and this old missionary, Homer Crane, he was like 350 years old. He'd been there all his life. And we're on this train and we're going through the Andes Mountains and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 24 years old and I'm like, wow, look at that, and the majesty and all this. And they're so gigantic and he's snoring. And I thought to myself, how can he do this? About 10 years later, I was leading a group of students through the Andes Mountains and they were all going, whoa, look at this. And I'm snoring. But we do the same thing with God. We are true circumcision. We are true Christians who worship in the spirit of God. This is this is not just discipline. It's not just force. It is a supernatural work of the spirit in every child of God that he promotes worship in that child. 
He promotes worship. Is the Spirit of God working in your heart, promoting worship, leading you to greater worship? And then he goes on and he says this. We're the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. Do you? Do you? Do you glory in Him? I mean, do you glory in Him? Do you rejoice in Him? Do you boast in Him? Do you think about Him? Is He the motivation of your life? His glory, His splendor, what He's done, who He is, what He's worthy of. Is that the thing that's pushing you? Do you glory in Him? Is He your only boast? Is He your only boast? Do you delight in Him? Do you think about Him? I can honestly say this morning, alarm goes off. Didn't go off. I woke up just right before it. 4.30. I'm 52. It's getting harder every day to get out of bed. And I said to myself, I said in prayer to him, I will get out of bed. I will do it for you. I will not do it for those students. I will not do it for I will do it for you. I will get out of bed for you. Is that your life? I will do it for you. I will do it for you. Why do we not sin? If you say we should not sin because it'll wreck your life, that's true. But if that's your ultimate motivation, that's idolatry. Sinners think that way. Self-preservation. I will not sin because it will harm me. Why do you not sin? Because you want Him. Because you want Him. Did you know I read an amazing thing in Deuteronomy? I'd never seen it before. God says to the nation of Israel, I brought you out in order to bring you in. That's what He says. I brought you out to bring you in. Why do we come out from the world? Why do we not touch that which is unclean? It's not because we just want to be clean. It's not because we want to be proper folk. If that's the case, go be part of a Pride and Prejudice cast. That's not why we do it. Why do we do it? We come out because we want to come in. We come away because we want to be with Him. I hear these songs so often, you know, these, these songs about heaven and streets of gold and gates of pearl and all these different... I could care less. I just want Him. He says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord. Who are you imitating? Give me your iPhone. Give me your iPad. Give me your computer. Let me see what you're watching. Let me follow you around. And I'll find that some of you are imitating the world and the stars of this world and the fashions of this world and everything about this world because you love the world because you are of the world. Who are you imitating? Paul said he knew these people had become Christians because they were imitating those who were Christians. It is getting such a heartbreaking thing for me to see 
even among these new reformed guys and these new young guys with all their good theology. They're grabbing a hold of their good theology, but it's not making its way down to anything. It's not changing the way they talk. It's not changing their masculinity. It's not changing femininity on the other side. It's not changing clothing. It's not changing speech. It's not changing media. It's not changing anything. So don't talk to me about all your good theology. Leonard Ravenhill used to say, everybody wants a new definition of Christianity. What we need is an old demonstration of Christianity. Who are you imitating? Stop trying to look like a cleaner version of the ungodliness that surrounds you. We're not relevant to this world because we look like the world. Because we're completely different. As I say, a $50 haircut, cool glasses, skinny jeans and a tattoo does not a prophet make. But a man and a woman renewed in their mind by the power of God and the power of God's word. He said, you became imitators of us. Having received the word in much tribulation with joy of the Holy Spirit. Are you walking with him with no tribulation? Or is the prophecy fulfilled in you that if you cannot run with footmen, how will you run with the horses? If you cannot serve him in the midst of a place where it's all about the gospel, if still you're filled with carnality and worldliness and you cannot serve him here, how will you serve him during tribulation? You will not. You will fall away. You will prove what you've always been. Not these. They received the word in the midst of tribulation so that you became an example to all the believers. What part of your doctrine and what part of your life should be exported and what part should be quarantined? The gospel you preach, should it be exported or quarantined? Your godliness, you're going out there to make the world a better place. Would you want all those people out there to have your godliness, your personal piety, separation from the world? Will that help them if they, if they imitate you? If they follow your example, will that help them? Will their life be better because they follow your example of piety? What about your devotional life? How much of your devotional life would you want other people? You're going out to disciple the world right now. You want them all to have your devotional life? Or should your devotional life be quarantined? I want you to think. Those of you who are Christian, press on. Press on. 30 years have now passed in my life and there's only one word for me. Press on, press on. In the mountains of Peru during the war, if you met a brother going down one of those trails with his donkey or his burro and you said, Como estas hermano? What he would say is this, avanzando hermano, avanzando. He would say advancing, advancing. If you're a Christian, advance. In piety. In knowledge, everyone wants to do all kinds of things. But what you do don't matter if it's not what you are. Concentrate on being a Christian, on being holy, on knowing God so that when you open up your mouth, something other than just the typical evangelicalism comes out. God's word comes out. Advance, believer, go. There's so much more for you. So much glory. So much more of his presence. So much more of his life. So much more of his power. Be encouraged. But for others of you, you've been, you've been marked today. You know your conscience is screaming at you. You know you're not right. You know it. Repent. Repent. Oh, I have spoken hard words here today, but it is only because I love thee.
I want so much for you.